How is everybody doing? Now, I'm not getting any comments here, so let me know if you are, are writing in comments. For some reason, I'm not getting any comments, and I usually get a bunch of comments. Boom, there's the first one. All right, hi, Vic. How are you doing? Uh, change from tech support to sales, and this has come from, boom, let me put you up here, man. Elkin Orozco. I work for it and love it so far. Sales is the best thing ever. Learning a lot. Man, I love it, man. Thank you, man, for joining me, man. Mike from Orlando. Thank you, brother. Thank you for joining us. Always a pleasure to have you, man. Jenna Berarba. Did I get that wrong? Did I just kind of kill that one? Thank you, Victor, for all you do. Amazing energy and priceless information. Love the picture, by the way, that you guys take there. Love it. Trey, my man, Trey. Trey, good ticket. It's good talking to you, man. So again, man, we'll be in touch. Mia Knox is in the house. All right. All right. Victor, listen to your sales triggers video, sales triggers video today. Great stuff. That is, by the way, I, should, I really should do a, um, uh, just a live stream just on the sales trigger, man. So Henry, man, thank you for the heads up on that, man. That's cool to know, man. Uh, Jessica, love you and love your energy. Love you right back. Boom, boom, right there. Thank you. Uh, we got... Carlos Aguirre. Carlos from Miami, Florida. I tell you, I live there, right? Carlos, I live by uh, Miami Lakes, man. Nice area, man. Mike Janice in the house. Love it, man. Let me see. JV, trying to take the sales aspect of what I do to the next level. Boom. Let's, uh, let's go to the next level, Jay. I'm with you, man. Franca Williams. What's up, Franca? You says, hi, Victor. Sounds serious, Franca. Don't be too serious, man. Thank you for joining us. Let me know where you're from, Franca. Chris C., good evening. Back at you, sir. Love it, man. And today we've got an interesting topic. First time watching. First time watching live? Mm. Watching toy live. Cool. I think I know something in there, right? But anyway, it'll be fun, man. It goes fast, by the way. So, uh, good evening. And again, Jails tells me for Jai's tuned. Jai, tell me where you're from. Tell me where you're from. I can tell the new people. They don't tell me where they're from. People who've been around. No, Christina from Austin. Love your videos. New sales here. New to sales here and learning a lot. Bam, Christina. Let's go make some money, Christina. Let's serve people and make money. That's the combination. Tahir Parawala. Good morning, man. Back at you. So you must be like in India, right? Somewhere or either in the UK. I can't be the UK. It has to be out there somewhere. Uh, great topic today. I think so too, Mia. Let's see where this goes. And then there's my man throwing up the ones and the twos. Hi, Victor. Thank you for giving me inspiration. You're the best. I'm selling houses like pancakes. <laughs> Dude, I would never put those two together, but that's awesome. Because of your podcast, man. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Especially uh, the sell like a squirrel, <laughs> the sell like a squirrel podcast, man. Thanks, man. I'm from the Philippines, man. Love the Philippines, man. Like I said, I went to that little volcano place. It was really cool, man. People there are just beautiful, man. Uh, but anyway, the yeah, the sell like a squirrel, man. Once you have that sell, sell like a squirrel mindset, and there's a book, by the way. So if you're part of my boom sales velocity academy, that one right there, uh, the books are in the sales velocity academy, and there's a book called Sell Like a Squirrel. Um, uh, uh, why the Squirrel Always Wins, I think that's the title of my book, so check it out, man. And then we got Scott Sanchez, double S in the house. Hey, Victor, awesome content. My first month in sales, and I'm loving it, man. You got to love sales, man. You got to love sales, man. And there she is. How could she not be here? Bridget Springer, good to see you right back at you. And then we got Melody Stephens. Stall camp. Can we just add some more names on this thing, Melody? Uh, from Independence, Kentucky. Love it, man. Need to rank up. Hey, I hear you on that. I hear you on that. Uh, good morning from Manila. Rigel Kent, the thriller in Manila. Jai's from Atlanta, hometown. Way to go, man. All right, man. Let me see. Cup of tea. Uh, it's almost complete. If Victor Tan's in the house, I think we can go with it. By the way, DFW in the house. Dallas, Fort Worth, JV, man. Welcome, man. Franco Williams is from Nigeria. Not so serious. Ah, I dig you already. I dig you already. And then we got Chad Schaefer. What up, Chad the ad man? Is that how you say it, man? That's cool, man. By the way, DFW in the house. Got it, man. Uh, we'll start in just a little bit. And by the way, if you're watching this on a replay, fast forward five minutes, man, because I got I to gotta talk to my peeps here real quick. Uh, good morning from the oh, that's a night, Mindanao, Philippines. Thank you for your inspiration, man. Ro, Robenji Moneda. 
Love it, man. Thank you for joining me. If I messed up that uh, name, I'm sorry. Home Loan Strategies. Good evening from GSP in the SC. Love it, man. <laughs> and there he is. Oh, now the evening's complete. Victor Tan's in the house. Uh, Henry Lee, clarification, confirmation. Boom. Gotcha, man. Nyla. Oh, man, Nyla. You're going to make me work tonight with this name. Nyla Monet. Monroe. I love it. Nyla Monet. I like the Monet part. Money, money, money. Monet Monroe. Awesome being alive, man. Thank you for joining me. Let me know where you're from also. Forever Fitness. Tony. G. Hey, hey. Right back at you, Tony, man. The Ranch Wife Fly. <laughs> I love it. The Ranch Wife Life. That's so awesome. Uh, this Ranch Wife Life. Boca, New Mexico. Or Raton, New Mexico, rather. There you go, man. All right. Trey's representing in the house for Atlanta. Adam Garcia, long time, brother. Boricua, como esta? Espero que todo esté bien. Are you still living in Puerto Rico, man? What part? Uh, it's been a while, man. We need to hablar, hermano. All right. Uh, let me see. Simon. I know it's Simon, man, but it just sounds so cool. You say Simon. Simon Hornstra. Hey, I'm renovating my house today. Back to selling tomorrow. Hey, man, good luck with the renovation, man. Uh, Monet's back at me with the hey. Love it, man. Good seeing you. Could you... Con could you concise on what we are going to learn today? We're going to talk about uh, how to get a customer to switch. What are some of the elements to get a customer to switch? So if you're, again, selling to a customer that's already buying from somebody else, if you want to sell to them, how do you get them to kind of move over to your side of the actual ledger, man? That's what we'll be talking about. Jitesh Punjabi. Let me know where you're from, Punjesh. Uh, from Biz Brisbane, Australia, mate. Hey, mate. Simon, what time is it there, man? It's got to be like what? Like... Let me see, you're about eight hours ahead, maybe like four in the morning, five in the morning. Wow. Uh, and my girl's from, all right, Maryland, the D.C. area. Greetings from Alberta, Canada. Hey, right back at you, man. Yeah, for sure. You betcha, man. And back at you, man. Thank you. All right. So uh, let's let's get to the topic. Because I can tell my man, Punjabi, is saying, Victor, let's get into this thing, man. Let's get rolling, man, right? All right. So uh, I'm going to cover a simple topic, and then we're going to talk about it. And if this is your first time, welcome aboard. So I give you some content up front, and then you can go at it, ask me questions. If you can stick to the actual content we're talking about, that'd be great. But if you feel like going off-road and doing your home thing, well, we'll figure out. We'll answer questions, okay? So uh, we got a, uh, 11 a.m. in Australia. Uh, we got some more shout-outs coming in. Love it, man. Hey, Victor, shout-out from Cote d'Ivoire. I, I think I got it right. If I didn't, I'm sorry, man. Uh, Last one here, and I'll just get into it. Yesterday, I watched Shortening Sales Cycle video. It was too good. Thank you, man. Thank you, brother. Uh, the Shortening the Sales Cycle is, I'm going to talk about the sales velocity equation in, not uh, Sunday. Sunday, I'm doing, by the way, Sunday, I'm doing the smart cold calling. Sunday, I'm doing smart cold calling. Sunday, I'm doing smart cold calling. You want to be in on this one. For all of you guys who have been asking me about cold calling, scripts and all that, Ooh, I got stuff for you, and I told somebody, I forgot who she was, but I said Sunday will be dedicated to smart cold calling. So, Sunday, same time, same station. All right, let's get into this. So, I came up with, as you know, my book, Sales Model. So, I'm taking this out of uh, one of my um, uh, models here. So, this is, uh, the subtitle is 50 Models for Effective Sales, to, uh, for Effective Selling. And the way my brain works, if you're out here for the first time, by the way, Tahir, you're absolutely right. It's Art Sabacek. That's who I'm, by the way, I got to highlight this. I got to highlight this because I want to make sure I give credit where credit's due. So, Art has a book called Smart Calling, right? And so, I went through his book and I got a shirt too. So, I'm going to even have Art's shirt with me. And I'm going to go through his book and I'm going to pull out the best of the best for you guys. I'm still going to recommend you get the book, but yeah. It's going to be all about art stuff. So, yeah, you're on it, man. So, it'll be interesting. So, I went through the book. I'm about, well, I didn't finish it yet. I'm about maybe 80% through it. And I've highlighted several things that I want to talk to you about on Sunday. And so, yeah, I told Art, man, uh, I got to have one of those shirts. So, I got a, a shirt from Art. And I, like I said, I'm going through his book. And, man, it's it's a beautiful book. I think you're going to love it. Very, it's, it's good. All right, let's get into this. So, one of the models in my sales model books and for those of you who are joining me for the first time, is I always say, since I have like ADHD, I can't remember a lot of things, I use models to remember things. So when I'm talking to clients, I always use models in my head. So this book, Sales Models, has 50 different models. So the one I want to talk about today is how do we get clients to switch? And again, let me just, let's not do that. Hold on a second. Let me erase that. I was messing with the board yesterday. Uh, black two, 
and there, and we are good to go. So, you know, getting customers to switch. So let's let's kind of let's kind of set this up, right? Uh, is that let's say you're trying, as I mentioned already, you're trying to sell to somebody who's using an existing product, or maybe even using an existing service. And so the question is, you know, you ever present something to somebody and you're like, it's obvious that you should switch, and they still won't switch. And so let's talk about the four mental hurdles that people have to get over in order to switch to your product or service. And right now, I think is a good time to get customers to switch to you. I know, we're living through a tough time, but also, I think there's a lot of opportunities in this business right now, now or in this market. Now, so let's, here's, my, here's the equation I use. You can just write the equation. This is my equation plus T. That's my equation. It's an awesome equation. I'm an engineer by trade, so I gotta have equation. So that's my equation. And so what I'm gonna do is go through this equation, and then we're gonna talk to, okay? Now, the first thing is, the first question that the customer has, first question is, if you want me to switch over to your product or service, is there a gain? That's what the G stands for. Is there a gain? That's the big one. Will I benefit from switching over to your product or your service? And you're going to obviously answer with yes, of course there's a gain. Now, we can measure gain in different ways, right? So we can say that there's a dollar gain, right? If they're looking for speed, there could be a time gain, right? If you're selling a service, it could be either one of these. If you're looking for revenue generation, that we'll call, give it a two. We can help you increase your revenue, reduce your cost, and maybe reduce the amount of time. So these are different gains that we can actually position with our customer. We could do it in more time. For example, if you're offering a service, let's say pool cleaning, right? Then maybe you can do it faster. You can probably do it for a little less money and you can do it faster. So, you know what I mean? That's a gain. My question to you is, what are the factors in your, in your product or service that you use as gain? Is it money? Is it cost? Is it revenue? Is it time? Right? What is it? Let's say you're in the, um, you have an exercise program, right? Or you have some type of fitness program. And people want to know, I'm using this program. Why should I use your program, right? In a B2C situation, why should I use your program? And your job is to figure out how to say, I can help you lose weight, right? Let's just use that as an example. But I can also help you do it in what? Less time and it won't cost you as much. So these are what I call the levers of gain, right? Now, so have that in your mind. What are your levers of gain? These are some of the basics. Maybe you'll have a couple more depending on your business. For example, one more. If you're in real estate, let's say you're very good at what you do. One of the things you might want to emphasize is the number of days that you typically have a house on the market. And you can say, look, we sell houses faster. So let's just say time on the market, we'll call it the time, we can reduce that, right? So again, everybody has different levers that they can use. Now, typically what you want to have is two or three different gain levers that you can convince your customer to want to move over to you. Now, here's the trick, because that was the easy part. Figuring out what levers we want to pull on to actually convince a customer to sell, hey, we can help you gain something, right? Whether it's gain money, gain time, whatever it may be, we can help you. So the next part of the equation then becomes, and this is where it gets a little complicated, because the equation was G and then there was the M. The M stands for, and this is what a lot of people don't get, it stands for magnitude, right? This is important. Because you can show me that you can reduce my cost. Says, yeah, Victor, you know, we can help you reduce your cost. And I go, I believe you. And then I can show you how to increase your revenue. Mm, I believe you. I can show you how to expand your market share. I probably believe you. I can show you how my program is better or faster than somebody else's. I would believe you. But then I'm going to ask the question, this is the key question, that they all want to know, by how much? Now, this is a really interesting question, by how much? Because if I can, for example, reduce your cost by 1%, you may like, ah, that's not enough, right? So what is that number? And we never really think about that, right? Now, there's a study that talk, I was talking to a client today when I do coaching. One of the things we talked about is price increases. And most people begin to notice price increases. Uh, it's called a just noticeable difference. People begin to notice an increase in price at the 5% mark, right? Kind of an average. 
cross-section average, varies by industry, but at 5% they begin to notice an increase in price. Well, I could almost say that also people begin to notice a reduction in price by 5%. Anything beyond 5%, maybe you start capturing somebody's interest. So for example, let's say that you can help me reduce uh, my cost. If you say, Victor, I can help you reduce your cost by 1% to 2%, I'm like, nah, it's not, my, it's not gonna move my motivation needle. But if you say, look, on average, when we work with companies like you in this industry and we implement this project, we can typically reduce your cost by, let's say, 5%. Now, 5% multiplied, whatever that revenue number is, again, it might be big, and it has to be big enough for them to go, okay, that's, that's quite sizable, right? So my question to you is, where do you think your customer's needle is when it comes to motivating them to actually take action? So for example, if you're selling a weight program or some type of health program, and on average, it takes people, and I'm making this stuff up, by the way, 90 days to lose 20 pounds. That's the average, 90 days to lose 20 pounds, making this up. But what if you came in and says, look, within 90 days, we can help you lose 30 pounds, which is a 50% increase. That's probably impactful, right? I don't know what that number is, but I want you to start thinking about what that number is. If I'm telling you that I want to replace your some type of software platform, you have software as a service, you're using a certain platform, I want to come in and I want you to switch over to mine because my system will make your salespeople more efficient, more productive, and I'm going to say, okay, great, I believe you, but by how much? And that's where we have to get into the quantification. This is where we got to put numbers down. Now, so let's talk about qualification, quantification, right? Here's qualification. We, we're faster. We're better. We're really, really fast. Well, how fast? Fast as fast can be, right? Well, we can deliver quicker. How quick? Really quick, right? That's qualification. That's not really telling the customer anything. What customers want are numbers, right? So my question to you is what type of numbers are you using to demonstrate the magnitude? How much? So for example, if, you have a, if you're doing real estate, and again, I'm just picking things out at random, and you know that the average day for an average house in a certain area on the market is, let's say, again, I'll just use 90 days, but because of your aggressive marketing and how you go after the market and whatever you use for posting, you can bring that down to, let's say, 70 days. You know what? That's a number. That's a number a customer wants to hear. That's a number, right? So for example, now let's say you reduce costs, right? You implement a new system that reduces costs. You're gonna reduce costs by how much? The customer wants to know how much. If it's 1%, 2%, might not move the needle. But if I can show you a five to 10% reduction in cost, and then I tie that to some huge number, right? That's gonna move my needle. So that's quantification. And so my question to you is, have you learned how to quantify your number, your savings? How are you helping them increase revenue? Whatever it may be, whatever levers of gain you're using, how do you calculate the magnitude? And by the way, you'll have to be able to prove it, of course. And so that's what people want to know. So that's the second hurdle. One is, yeah, we're better, we're faster. And then the second question, yeah, but by how much? And that's what they want to know. And if you can't, this is a tough one to get over, by the way, because if you can't quantify by how much, give them some averages, some numbers, they're going to pull back. Right? They're not they're going to say, well, that, that's not a big change. Uh, one of the examples I always use is that if you're, you got a, you're a cable company, and I'm currently using some ISP, right, Internet Service Provider, and they come in and they tell me, look, Victor, I can help you save, you know, five bucks a month on your bill. Would I take the deal? The answer is no. It's not big enough. The magnitude's not big enough. Now, if he says, I can save you $20 off that 80, well, let me think about that, because that's a big number, right? $20 is a big number. And so, again, my question to you is, what numbers would motivate your clients to actually move forward? Does that make sense? Hit me with a one if I'm making sense right now, man. Uh, you guys are coming in. Uh, some of you also have ADHD. That's cool. I like to hear that. Now, number three. And again, once I finish all four, we'll have a dialogue. We'll have a discussion. And if I missed your question, retype it in. Once we get into the question and answer session, you know, just retype your question in again if I missed it. So I'm not trying to ignore people. I just got a lot of comments scrolling once in a while. And by the way, somebody was asking me, how does this work? I got comments coming in from Twitter Periscope. I got comments that come in from Facebook. I got comments that come in from Twitch. I got comments that come in from YouTube. So they're all over the place. So now, step number three. 
So, you, you let them know that by using your product or service, there will be a gain. And then, you demonstrate it that it's a substantial gain, that there is some magnitude there. There's some, there's some serious money here. Now, here's what's interesting. Just because you demonstrate it that you can improve their system, their process, their service, whatever it may be, and you demonstrate it the magnitude, like I can save $20 on a cable bill, then the third hurdle, this is where the real glitch comes in. The thing is, I call this P with a small e, and this stands for perceived effort. And what they want to know, okay, you convinced me, Victor, it's better. And you showed me that it's how much better. But the, now the question they have is, well, how much time and effort do I have to put in to make this happen? Let's go back to my cable TV example. I love using that one because everybody has, you know, cable TV or internet service, right? If somebody says, Victor, I can save you $20 a month. I'm like, oh, you know, that's kind of enough to move my needle, right? I'm kind of, yeah. But then I start thinking, well, what's that going to involve me to switch over? Well, you know cable companies, you know internet service providing people, right? They say they'll come over in a very specific time, like from 9 in the morning till 5 p.m. They give you a very specific window, right? Joking. And so now that means I might have to take off a day of work. Uh, that means I might have to, you know, take a day off of work, maybe cancel a couple of meetings. Uh, I got things scheduled already. And then I'm also thinking, okay, if, if I'm just waiting around, that's one thing. But what happens? I mean, as far as the contract, I have to cancel my contract with the existing provider. So that means I then got to return the modem after they switch out the modem. I got to take that back. And all of a sudden, I start thinking about all these things that have to happen, that I have to do. If I cancel the contract, what is that going to take? Do I have to go to the office and cancel or can it cancel online? And if I cancel, is there going to be a fee? What's the fee? I don't know. Uh, and if I have to return the modem, do I have to mail it in? Do I have to go drive over there and take it in? Also, this cable guy is coming. Do I have to take a day off of work? Do I have to find a babysitter? What do I have to do? So all of a sudden, this perceived effort and I also call it an imagined fear because people start thinking, okay, these are all the things I have to do just to switch over. In the case of a cable company, my imagined fear could also be, well, how do I know it's going to work? And how do I know I'm really going to get the bandwidth speeds that they're promising? If you're selling real estate, somebody's saying, look, I've been working with this person for a while. And because you have a personal connection with somebody, it's hard to break off a relationship. See, the perceived effort here is that I've worked with this company for so long. Let's say you're selling a product to a company, a manufacturing company, right? You're selling a product. And all of a sudden, you know that they've been working with, you know, competitor A for a long time. You've demonstrated that you have a better product. You've demonstrated that there is a gain and there is a magnitude to the gain. But now the manager in that company is thinking about what do I have to do to switch over? What's that going to require? So, uh, from a professional level, they're going to say, well, I get, we got to change the system. We got to do some beta testing. We got to do some retraining. We got to do all these things. And then on top of that, <clears throat> I have to cancel a relationship on a personal level. I don't feel comfortable canceling because they've been good to us. So why would I want to do that? So all this is on the perceived effort or an imagined fear. And this is where we get stuck. Now, how do you handle that? How do you handle that? Because that's what I got to answer for you. I can talk about this. You got that. But how do you handle perceived fear? The reality is when you're dealing with this type of switchover, you have to really walk the customer through how everything works so you can reduce that fear. Remember, I say sales is very simple. You got certainty and anxiety, right? Certainty and anxiety. So if there's an equal amount of certainty and anxiety, nobody's going to buy. If there's a lot of anxiety, they're definitely not going to buy. Our job in sales is to increase certainty and reduce that anxiety. Increase certainty and reduce anxiety. <clears throat> So what we want to do right here is basically explain to the customer, here's how the process works. Go back to my cable, cable situation. They can say something like this. The salesperson can say, look, now we demonstrated there is some savings here. Now you're probably thinking, Victor, how does this work? Well, first of all, we're very specific in terms of what time we're going to be there. So we'll let you know within a one to two hour window that we will be there. And I'm thinking, okay, I don't have to spend a whole day. Also, what we do is we know that you're working with whatever, you've got this cable provider. What we do is we cancel the contract for you. We handle that. In fact, not only do we handle that, we also pay any fees and we actually return the modem on your behalf. 
Now, what are they doing? They're reducing all that perceived effort. Like, oh, I don't have to do that. Oh, I don't have to do that. Well, great, I don't have to do that. So do I have to do anything? No, you just have to be there to receive the service. And by the way, here are three references you can call of neighbors in your area who were, we've given the service to already. And you can ask them and validate for yourself that our bandwidth speeds are as we say they are, right? Whatever it may be. If you're selling, I don't know, a manufacturing product, same thing. Mr. Customer, here's how it works. When we switch over, typically this happens within a one week time frame. Da 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 da, you explain the steps. Step number one, step number two, then we do the training, then we do the data switch over, then we go on live. And typically, Mr. Customer, this is done in five days, if not less. And I can give you three references of clients we've worked with where we switched them over within one week. And all of a sudden, you're reducing all that effort. We handle the training, we have online training, we have in house training, whatever it may be, so forth and so on. And all of a sudden, the customer goes, oh, okay, okay, I get that, I get that. And all of a sudden, you're reducing that level of effort in their head, that perceived image. Then the last part, if you convince them that there is a gain, and there's a big enough gain called the magnitude, and you realize that the switchover is not going to be that hard to do, you're going to make it effortless for them, then the last part, always the tricky one, the big T, do they trust you? Do they trust what you're saying? Do they believe you? Do they actually believe what you're saying? Now, I've seen people jump all these three hurdles, but at the end of the day, if somebody doesn't trust you, they simply don't trust you. And now all of a sudden, that's it, the deal's gone. <clears throat> now, the way I look at trust is, I look at, because trust is a something, it's very interesting, right, to define trust, but here's two elements of trust, I believe, really encapsulate what trust really means. When you're talking to a customer at this, during this part, during this part, during this part, they want you to take their point of view. They want you to look at it from their point of view. Like, Victor, I understand that one of the concerns you have is that switching over might cause you other problems. In fact, you might lose service or whatever it may be. And you're also concerned that you're going to have to take a whole day off. I'll be like, yeah, I was concerned about those things. So they want you to take their point of view to understand their fears. That's how you sell in today's market. If you understand their fears, you're getting it. But also, they want to know you have their best interest in mind, the BIM. Best interest in mind means you're looking out for them. I mean, imagine talking to a customer who said, and you're, you're trying to get them to switch over, and then they say something like, uh, I think I want that service. You say, no, you don't want that. Let me explain why you don't want that. Here's what you want, and it's going to save you a little bit of money. In other words, you just downsold them a little bit, right? And so whatever it may be, whatever you need to build trust, do that. If you can take their point of view, if you can actually, again, be on their side, have their best interests in mind, that's what real trust is. And so what I want you to do as you're listening to me, as, as you're thinking about this after you get off this live stream, is ask yourself, you know, do I do this? Do I understand what my gain levers are? In other words, where I can help the customer win. Can I help them reduce costs, expand market share, increase revenue, reduce the number of times on, you know, the days on the market? help them lose weight faster, whatever it is. And then magnitude, can I prove it? And they're gonna say, by how much? Like how fast can you do it? It's like how much, how soon? How much, how soon? That's what they wanna know. And the last part is your job, part of your presentation, and I'll do a separate live stream on presentation process, is to really explain to the customer that this is gonna be, you know, smooth, easy to do, not that hard. And it is during this presentation of this content that you will develop the trust with the customer if you do it the right way. So it's something to think about. When you're talking to clients, what often gets us, it's not that it's not we don't have a better product, sometimes we do. Sometimes we show the magnitude like, you know, how much, how often, how soon, we show them benefits. But then the perceived effort kills us because they're thinking it's too hard to do, I don't want to do it. And they'll say, well, you know what, let's do that next quarter. Well, I'll look at it again next month, and so forth and so on. And then you know how to work trust, work that into your presentation. And that's what I had for you tonight. And so now let's see if we have some cool questions here. All right, I know there's a lot of uh, stuff going on here. Hold on a second. And my Catherine Flores, hi, hi Victor, Kathy from Phil's. All right, I'll take that's Philadelphia, right? Mike Janice, sell the Trinity, learn from the master. So the value Trinity is increase revenue, reduce costs, or expand market share. And again, you can adjust it, add to that. Like again, maybe it's real estate, number of days, sales cycle on the actual, you know, on the market. If it's weight, 
How fast can you help them reduce it? So again, figure out what your trinity is. Now, we got Caleb Weathers. Hi, Victor. I will be starting this Friday at Charter Spectrum as an inside sales rep. This will be my first sales job. Do you have any advice? Yeah, listen to me, Caleb. Uh, seriously speaking now, the, just remember, learn as much as you can. <clears throat> don't, rem don't forget that in order to sell to people, again, serve people, take your word for it, you know, whatever word you want to use. But Caleb, remember, you got to use your natural voice. Be a pro, be professional, but be natural. Have that conversation. Engage with them. And you're going to feel, you know, you're going to have some butterflies here, but people are going to tell you to sell this way. They're going to tell you to sell that way. Listen to all of it. Take the best of the best content, right, from people. But at the end of the day, it has to come through you, brother. Okay? So just remember, be you at the end. Talk to people. Uh, Joyce, Wirt, Clunk. Hi, Victor. Good to see you again. Last time we were on life or debt. We were on life. Last time we were on life or debt. Joyce? Why don't I know that name? Joyce, help me out here. Help me with more. Give me more. Uh, Caleb, know the heck out of your custom product service and your comp competition. I'm with TDS. There you go. Henry, you're on it, man. Good job, man. Good job. I like when you guys share content or advice with each other. Martin Zank. I sell propane and work angles like this all day. This is the truth, Victor. Could also be convenience or hassle that they have to deal with. Yes, Martin, right? It's just that if they think it's going to be a hassle, that's, that's enough to turn them off or want to delay it, right? Defer it for another time. So, dude, you're so on it, man. Uh, I'm a restaurateur. I run restaurants here in Mumbai. Could you be... Uh, could you be, correlate things with the uh, restaurant slash food industry in this case? Uh, you're trying to get people to come over your restaurant, right? And so how could I relate that to restaurant business? Because there's two parts of it. The restaurant is just trying to get people to come over. This could be part of your marketing campaign. How do you get people to come over? Uh, and if you're in a high traffic area, maybe you can suggest times to come down there to reduce the, you know, the amount of time it takes. Because if I'm going to go to a new restaurant, I'm thinking, you know, how long is it going to take to get there and how much you know, is it is it going to be more expensive or is the ambiance going to be different? I would I would angle for those things, right? If I'm trying to get if I'm trying to steal customers from my competitor, so to speak. So let me know if that works for you. You know, again, there's so many ways you can look at it because then the on the inside part of the restaurant business is again uh, you're basically buying, so you're on the winning side. So yeah, I would think about taking customers from other restaurants. What could you offer them? Maybe the experience will be different. Maybe when they come in, the wait time will be reduced. In other words, average restaurants have a wait time of this. We have an average wait time of this. Uh, most restaurants have only this many, you know, so much square footage. We have this much square footage. I would try to find little advantages like that to test. So hopefully that helps, man. Integrity is big. Big Juan, Mike Juan. Love you guys, man. You guys are on it. Chris C. in the house. Martin Zenk, again, it would correlate to catering to businesses, not restaurant. It would correlate to catering to businesses, not restaurants. So that means if you were selling to, are you helping Jitesh here? If you're selling to businesses uh, who are already buying from a given restaurant, what would be the difference? Food's gonna arrive warmer, food will arrive faster. You know, you can just really build some nice, you know, levers in there if you give it some thought. So, beautiful, man. Yes, so much cup of tea, a bunch of you guys, a bunch of one, one, ones, man, to hear one. Victor Tan one, got it, man. You guys are on it. Makes sense. Love it, man. You guys are with me. The test. Thank you, man. Uh, as you explain your equation, I get to real. I realize it is an excellent presentation script. Simple, practical, and punchy. I like to keep them simple, man. I, I try not to complicate things. I think a lot of um, you know sales traders tend to complicate things. And at the end of the day, I'm not saying sales is easy. I'm not saying it's not complicated, but it ain't hard, as I always say, right? When you know what you're doing. And I think the more you can simplify a process into steps that you can have in your head, the models, you'll be more effective at selling. So thank you for the feedback on that. Appreciate that, man. Uh, Jenna, what do you say? For those of us in equipment like sales, uh, the PE would be equivalent to a learning curve. Yes, it would be, right? And you know, when you're selling equipment also, it's not only the learning curve, uh, Jenna, but it's like... You know, if you have to swap out, let's say, one thing for another, they, you know, it's the internal systems, right? Standard operating procedures have to be rewritten. Uh, data has to be put into the system. You know, things of that nature. From an administrative standpoint, you can look at it also as some issues might be there. Like all the things we'd have to switch over. On top of that is the trading with the learning curve. So I agree with you 100%, man. John Patrick, man. Thank you, brother. Uh, Henry. 
Tell the customers to keep their existing service active for no lapse in service in a telecom setting. Cool, man. Uh, trust is all that matters. At the end of the day, they better trust you, man. Uh, Trey, what do you got, man? Uh, some prospects are simply lazy and get compla comfortable and com with complacency. Yes, they do, right? Or they fear change. You have to hit them with the value hard. Uh, the PE almost paralyzes some people. Definitely need to hold their hands through that process to close them. And so the natural tendency is not so much clients, Trey. You know, would you agree with this? It's kind of human nature, right? It's like, yeah, it's going good. You know, why mess with it? Why, you know, things are going good. I see it's a little improvement, but in their head, they're going, I don't want to deal with all this stuff. I got enough things to deal with. But you are absolutely right. The PE is all about, again, if you can hold them, they'll hold their hand, as you say, and just give them a blueprint, kind of a timeline of how this is going to work. People, you can feel that resistance go down. I mean, you can really feel it go down. So great insight, man. Great insight. Uh, Yuta Zhang. It's nice. Cool. Dimitri. Whoa, son. Man, I like saying that. Dimitri. Whoa, son. Whoa, son. Do they trust themselves enough to make the right decision and to trust you? <laughs> I love it, right? And that, By the way, you know, it's funny because you're joking about that, but I, I, I think you're serious also, right? Do they even trust themselves to make a decision? And, and that comes from, this is important, what you're saying, Demetrius, is so powerful, you know, because sometimes people don't trust themselves to make a decision because they've had bad experiences in the past and maybe they've made bad decisions and now they don't even trust themselves to make that decision. So you bring in a little, you, uh, that's a nice subtlety you bring in there, Demetrius, man. Thank you for your uh, insight on that. Very powerful, man. Thank you very much. Awesome, man. You're awesome. How do you handle the objection? I just need to check if we are under contract. Uh, so on that, if you're switching from one to another, let's say a cable company, uh, you know, right there, I'd be like, pull up the contract. You know what I mean? If you could do that, it would be like, pull up the contract and see if they would actually pull up the contract in front of you. Now, what's interesting is that just asking that question, I said, well, do you have the contract with you? And I can help you review it very quickly. Right, because you're in the, assuming it's a cable thing and you're in their house. I said, well, pull up the contract. I'll, I'll review it with you right now. But if you've worked with the customers, you know, with that type of uh, competitor before, in other words, you've kicked them out in the past. Says, look, we've worked with it. We've seen the contract. We know what your contract looks like. So there, there could be the more assertive approach. We know what the contracts are. Trust me, we know what their contracts are for the last two, three years. So if you sign that contract within the last year, we can tell you it's in there. And again, we'll guarantee that we'll absorb any cost that are not covered in that contract. Or just ask them, can I see your contract? And what's always interesting about that is to watch reaction. Like some people go, sure, let me go get it. That, that tells you I'm interested, right? That's kind of a buying signal. If they say, well, you know, I don't know where it's at. I'll have to look for it later and I'll just get back to you. Ah, oh, they're kind of blowing you off, right? At that point, I'm thinking maybe they're not serious. So keep that in mind. So yeah, there you go, man. So like the point of view, yes, that's the trust part, right? Is how do you develop on the response block selling as you raise the objections before they do? In this case, when you're doing the POV, which is taking their point of view, is really just trying to get in their head and feeling their pain, as I always talk about. You feel their pain and go, look, I know what you're going through. He says, you know, uh, for example, we had, and I used the roof we put up in our house. It's like, you know, when we put up a, a roof, it's like, first of all, it's an expensive proposition too. There's so many options, you're confused. I get that. Number three, you're wondering about this and that. And I go, and I go, oh, yeah, he gets it, right? Or she gets it. And then on your best interest is, again, what I love about what the roofing guy did to us was we said a couple of things like, no, doesn't matter. You don't want to spend your money there. I mean, he actually told us not to spend money on certain shingles. He says, if you want to spend money to really make that roof better, you spend it here where the awnings are, da 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 you do these things. That's where you want to spend your money. That's not going to help you that much. And I was like, and so that's part of that, you know, that challenger sale where you challenge the customer by telling them, let me help you out. Because again, if you position yourself, and I know it's an overused phrase, as a trusted advisor, like somebody who really cares, and people feel that, that's, that's important. People feel that. Like you're not trying to sell them, man. I'm just trying to help you. This is why I talk, when I talk about selling, I'm like, don't sell, man. Just try to help them. And if they can feel that, and then, and I think, uh, uh, I forgot the name, you were suggesting that, you know, learn your product, be the expert in your product, be that domain expert. That's what makes Caleb, that's what makes a great salesman, Caleb. If you just know your product and then you sell because you care, I'm trying to help you out, I'm trying to help you save money, I'm trying to reduce your cost, listen to me. And people feel that, just say it in a nice way. 
Aaron Chow says, awesome. Dude, AC, you're awesome. Uh, thank you for helping me out uh, get out of the dip. Man, the motivational dip. We all get into a dip, right? We all get into a sales funk. But man, just eh, get through it. Uh, yesterday, yesterday I was in a funk, man. I don't know why, but I was in a funk. You know how you just can't do anything? So can I tell you what I did yesterday? Now, I work from home, so I'm self-employed, so I can do these things. Man, I just, I just took like maybe half a day and binged on Netflix. I did. I got to tell you, I'm being honest here. I binge. I just said, I, my brain was like, I can't, I can't think of anything right now. I don't feel like doing anything. But then something weird happened. I went out, took a walk. And then after that walk, which is one of the things I always say about getting out of a dip, boom, I was back on it. It was like my brain just needed to rest for a while, you know? So sometimes you just got to give yourself permission because nobody else is going to give it to you to kind of let, you know, just go easy on yourself. Don't be so hard on yourself. So man, thank you, man, uh, on getting out of the dip. Uh, fast. Uh, I'm a service technician. 80% of my job is selling electrical jobs. How do I deal with customers who call for quotes? The classic, I need to get three estimates. How do I handle this rejection, uh, this objection? When somebody tells me they're already, you know, coming out for three quotes, you know, that's already, you know, that type of business where, you know, it's, it's a race to the bottom. You know, the, the problem is with that type of business or that type of mindset, when somebody says, I'm trying to, you know, do get three estimates, First of all, they're just trying to get three estimates. I, they're not even telling you if they're going to present yours. So I would qualify that if I've worked with a certain company before and they're telling me that I'm going to get three bids, I said, look, I typically invest about an hour in putting these bids together. I said, if you just want pricing, I said, you know, here's your price. Go away. They're not going to buy. Do you know what I mean? Have you ever like kind of looked at your like track record of people who just call in for pricing and say, I'm looking for three estimates? Now, they think they're being honest with you, but they're actually being ridiculous with you because... You know, why would you call somebody and say, look, uh, it's a bake-off, you know, and whoever gives me the best price wins. And so if somebody says, I'm looking for three estimates, I would just kind of say, so quality doesn't matter. And what he's gonna, and that's a pattern in it, Robert. So quality doesn't matter, just price. So I can give you anything as long as I got, I got the right price. He says, no, quality matters. I said, well, does delivery matter? He's going to say, yeah, delivery matters. So if we have better products and better delivery, is that going to help? You know, is that going to supersede the price? And then at least you now you're having a different conversation. I'm not saying that's going to help because I've been in that situation where people just want price. But you'll notice that uh, people who deal with you on a regular basis, you say you remind them of quality, delivery, and service. Those are the people who are going to think. But again, remember, they want the number from you. This is the part most people forget. When somebody calls you for pricing, who's in control? You. You're in control. Because people say, no, I just want price. I said, I'd be more than happy to give you price. Let me just ask you a couple of questions. Take control of the conversation. And you say something like this. I said, you're only asking about price because you want three estimates. So I'm assuming that you don't care about the quality, you don't care about the service, and you don't care about the support. Is that a true statement? And I'm telling you that'll stop them dead in their tracks. Again, I'm not saying that's going to solve your problem because price hunters are price hunters. They're commodities, right? And if you're in a commodity business, it's really tough because everybody has the same product. Uh, I'll give you an example. It's like uh, years ago, I bought some golf clubs, right? Uh, horrible at golf, by the way. Horrible. Uh, but I look good in my shorts. So horrible at golf. And I realized that golf clubs, really, they're like commodities. You know, the names change, right? TaylorMade or whatever it may be. And, you know, again, if you argue with pros, they'll say, obviously, there's a difference. But for the average person, most golf clubs are the same. It's a commodity product. So I... I I'm not giving you a real answer, but I would take control of the conversation. I hate when people call me about price and just say, you know, because it's a bake off. It's, it's the so Christina, that was great. Thank you, Christina. So let me go back to the price. Let me just kind of explain what this is the pricing spiral. If you're not familiar, here's what happens. He says, you bid here, right? You bid him at this much, right? Right. Then he walks over to this guy and this guy bids him at that price. Then he goes over to C and C bids him at this price, right? So now what happens is that this guy now has a number for whatever product you're selling. He has a number, right? And he's going to go with the lowest bidder, right? Now, the next time he goes out, where do you think he's going to start? Right there. And then he does the same thing. Let me go to A. Ask him for a number, B. And this is called a race to the bottom. And a race to the bottom basically means that eventually people will drop out because they go broke. If you're getting a lot of people who are calling only for price, then I'm saying your marketing is not working because you're not finding quality clients. I'm not blaming you. I'm just saying that your marketing department, because if that's all you're getting, then, you know, it's not that it's not worth it. So that's my complete answer on that. Aaron says, thank you, man. Thank you, man. 
And so let me know if I answered that question. That was a good one and a tough one at the same time. Do you recommend social proof to help move the needle? For example, play a video or an audio clip of a few happy customers or clients. Oh, Chad, the ad man. Great question. So Chad, in a presentation, like I said, I don't know the scenario, but the problem with doing video sometimes is that, you know, well, first of all, let's talk about testimonials. Some people have horrible testimonials. Like, you know how people just don't, are not natural. So the first thing I would say is, yes, video testimonials can be good. Notice how I qualify that can be good if you get the right ones. If you get the ones that says, oh, Chad, he's the greatest. He's the ad man. He really helped our business. We love him. You should work with him too. He's Chad, the ad man. You know, you get those testimonials and, and people don't even sound natural, right? But if you can get, I would say the, the, the video should almost be like a mini commercial. Do you know what I mean? Like, like high produced commercial. Like I go over to the client's place, right? I bring, you know, a one man or two person film crew with me, right? And we film what they're doing. Now imagine, uh, I spent, uh, I have a video. Uh, I wish I could pull it out. I should, I should have, maybe I'll do it next time. I paid $9,000 for a one minute video. This is a few years back, right? People told me I was crazy. $9,000, and trust me, I didn't want to spend $9,000. It's a lot of money. But keep in mind that at that time, I was charging $10,000 and $15,000 for a keynote or a workshop. So in my brain, I'm going, all I got to do is get one deal and I got my money back. And so I had this highly produced. In fact, if you go to my website, victorantonio.com, you'll see it. It's one, it's got, it got these little moving pictures. That's $9,000 worth. And that video has made me so much money. I mean, beyond, you know, the 9,000 was easily worth it. So I would say yes, if they're well produced and they're well, I'm not saying well scripted, but they're well produced. Notice the difference is well scripted. You tell people what to say and people kind of go, eh, they're just kind of, you know, talking out loud. But well produced means that you went over there, you filmed, you, you, you spend some time with the customer and you produce this like one minute video that people go, oh, say, okay, these guys really put together a production. So, let me know if that helps, because I think that's the difference. That's how I would cut that, you know, slice the difference. Can I use your Mount Nut in a presentation? Uh, Mount Nut means people buy for five reasons, don't buy for five reasons. No money, no time, no need, no urgency, no trust, right? And so these are things, cup of tea to keep in mind, right? Is it money? Typically not. Is it time? Typically not. Then you get to need. Some people say, I need something, but they go, I don't really need it that bad. So you have to create a sense of urgency, right? Now, how would you tie that into what I just suggested? So, and my, by the way, the T is trust. The urgency piece is the quantification piece, uh, cup of tea. You know what I mean? By that is, people know, you know what? I do need to change. I, I should go to a better cable company, but yeah, I'm okay with this one. But now, if I stress, here's what you're missing out on, and now I create that urgency, then I get people to move. But again, even if I create that urgency through quantification, showing them numbers, again, reducing the perceived effort, but increasing the pain in terms of how much money they're losing, how much money they could be making, how fast they could be selling their house, whatever it may be, I still have to get to the trust piece. So yes, you can use it. Just keep in mind, you have to create a sense of urgency. So you can use the quantification piece. And Inkle, John spelled incorrectly, is back in the house. Inkle, can you just kind of make a short? These, these are long questions, man. All right. Hi, Victor. I can't even see myself. Hi, Victor. Thank you once again. Question, how do you reconcile the marketing and sales? Most of the time, marketing seems to be know-it-all, but they are just in the office. They, they are like a, they like a different target market than what the sales thinks. For example, marketing looks for new markets, unsaturated ones, but sales wants to compete and get clients to switch with them, da 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 Okay, I get that. Uh, you're beating up on marketing. I love it, I love it. So this is a good question. It's a very good question, man. It's a long question, but it's a good question, right? Because something has changed in the market, Ankle, and that is, and so right now you have, you know, this right going on, right? Sales and marketing just missing each other. They wanna go after some blue ocean, right? Some new markets, unsaturated. And you're thinking, wait a minute, we can make money here if we just sell to our existing customer base, right? And so first of all, that's really a strategic uh, question and a decision that the VP of sales in your company should be making. Like, what are we doing? 
because the VP of sales carries the number, right? By that I mean is responsible for the actual annual quota. So the VP of sales should make that decision. If you have VP of sales not make a decision, eh, that could be a problem. But the VP of sales should say, what are we trying to do? Are we trying to go after a new market or are we trying to go after our existing market and win more business, right? As I always say, there's gaining new clients, right? And then there's upselling and growing your existing clients. Two different strategies. I think I talked about this in one of my other live streams, Ankle. And so if that's not being clarified, that's usually a VP of sales problem, right? So you got a, you got a sales management problem not clarifying that with marketing. But let's say you have a good VP and he is clarifying that and marketing's not listening. Well, now you have a chief marketing officer problem that you might want to take to the CEO and say, look, uh, we're going after this business because the VP of sales has a lot of power because the VP of sales is the person bringing in the money, obviously with the help of salespeople, right? So that VP needs to leverage. So I had the same problem. I had a marketing team who wanted you know, even their marketing was all rosy and just off message. And I finally said, look, you're using my money. Because remember, VP sales drive the revenue. You give some of that money to marketing. And so if we're giving it to marketing, guess what, marketing? You need to help me out. And so I got together with the VP of marketing and we had a great conversation about what we we're trying to do and we figured out a strategy that made us both happy. Now, let's give marketing some credit though, because marketing may be thinking, look, we're seeing new opportunities. We've seen, we're seeing faster growth in certain opportunities. Now, marketing, years ago, I just kind of, they were like the Rodney Dangerfields of, you know, of business. Rodney Dangerfield, guy who used to say, I, I never get any respect, right? Marketing people never get a lot of respect. Today, marketing deserves a lot of respect because people are going online searching for content, and if marketing is doing their job, by the time they get to you, they know about your product and they know how good you are. So we got to give marketing some respect now, right? So I think your VP of sales and your VP of marketing need to get together and say, okay, here's the strategy. We're either trying to grow the business or we're trying to, you know, upsell and cross sell our existing business rather or gain new clients. What are we trying to do? Are we going blue ocean or are we just upselling and cross selling to try to grow our existing business? And then you may find out that the VP of sales may say, you know what? We're going to have two strategies, two separate teams. We're going to have two different marketing strategies to go after each market. So that's my answer. Since I don't know more, that's all I can give you right now. But hmm, when I offer something by mail, customer says pass, says pass, nothing else. How can you probe nicely? Mike, man, I get so many emails from people. And, you know, my, my biggest problem with emails, Mike, and I don't know what the process is, Mike K, is that... People just like, there's like no foreplay, man. You know what I mean? It's almost like, you know, that's the best, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. There's no foreplay. It's just like, hey, are you interested? I'm like, well, I don't even know who you are, right? And so I think that's a problem. I think, you know, when I look at how people approach selling sometimes, I think when you just send an email, I think that's the easy way out. And again, I don't know your business, so maybe that's the only way you can get a hold of people. But if there's a way to really create relationships with top 20, 30, 40, 50 clients, I would start connecting with them on social media, start getting to know them, share, like their content, stuff like that. You know what I mean? Before I'd reach out and just say, hey, are you interested? Because I get so many cold emails that I'm just like, oh, I just, because, and they all start out, Victor, I, I looked at your profile and you look like a very interesting person. I'm like, really? I've had people actually try to sell me sales training. Like, we could help you with your sales. And I'm like, you didn't even read my profile. You know what I mean? So I don't know if I helped you much on that one, Mike, but that was the honest answer. It's hard, man. It's If you're doing cold emails, unless you're connecting with them ahead of time, it's very hard. So, you know, you can do some copywriting, you know, get great subject line, put some great content, have a killer proposal. Uh, in the Sales Velocity Academy, I have, um, you know, something called the perfect voicemail, but also there's one called predictable prospecting where I show you, you know, how to write out scripts and also do voicemails, but also send powerful emails that actually add value to the actual, you know, email. So check that out. I think you'll like it. I think you'll like it. There's some good stuff there, man. Uh, I was unofficially assigned as to go to Spanish speaker. I've had a significant increase in my book of business, but I find myself having to spend more time with these clients for a 50% split. Fair. So in other words, you have to deal with customers because tu hablas español. Uh, I've been in that situation before uh, when I started, like I was an engineer who had to support salespeople in Latin America. So the when you say, is that fair? I always ask the question, are you getting compensated fairly enough? 
Come on, man, we're in sales, man. Because if I'm dealing with customers in Espanol, right, in Spanish, and that's taking they're more than 50% of my business, but that's hurting and impacting my business on the other side then guess what? That's not fair. So my question to you is, are you getting compensated fairly? And only you can answer that, man. So that's the question I would ask for my manager. I said, look, I'm spending all this time working this market. I'm happy to do that because it helps the business grow, but that's impacting my numbers here. So either you lower my quota, figure out a compensation plan that would make it equitable for you and I so we can both be happy and really have that direct conversation. And I think that's, that's a valid point that if you've been designated that guy, but they're taking up more time than usual, then I would begin to quantify that. I said, look, on average, I'm, you know, instead of three emails, now I'm doing seven emails. And because of this, I'm doing this. And so begin to have, have that conversation with your manager. It's a good conversation to have, Angel. Uh, tough one, man. That's a good one. I was taught if you can't find pain, that I need to create it. Is this sound... Uh, Tom, you're really going to mess with me tonight. So, because, you know, it's... You, you have to... By the way... I don't, like the, I don't like the way you phrased it, find pain. I like to think, make them aware of a pain they don't know they have, right? You know, it's, it's almost like some customers don't know where they're losing money. Some customers don't know because, again, we assume customers know everything. Our job as salespeople is to come and say, hey, you're not, you're not looking at this. I joke about this. I have a speech online. I talk about back in the day we used to listen, you know, remember, remember record players? And then from record players, what happened? Uh, the A track comes out. Remember A tracks? If you're old enough, A tracks, we're happy, right? So we become dissatisfied with the, with the record players. We move to A track. Then comes the cassette. Cassette smaller, 12 songs versus eight. And it's smaller, you know, music is portable. So we become dissatisfied with the A-track. We move over to the, uh, the cassette. What happens? The cassette comes out and then, then comes the CD. Did everybody move over to the CD? Not right away. Here's what happened, Tom. What happened was, you know, people were going square versus rounds, cassette versus CD, why move over? And so then the marketing people, that's why marketing people I like now, marketing geniuses, how do we make people unhappy or as, uh, as Ernest Dichter says, how do we make people constructively discontent? See, I would use that phrase, Tom. How do you make people constructively discontent? And so what happened is, how did they make people unhappy with the cassette so they'll buy the CD? What they did is they pointed out the hiss that was in the background on this cassette. It says, you won't hear that with a CD. Now, the reality is most people never even heard the hiss in the background until somebody pointed it out. When the marketing people began to say, look, listen to a cassette, you're going to hear in the background. You won't hear that with a CD. When, people, when you pointed that out, people go, oh, that's nasty. I don't like that hiss, right? That's our job as salespeople. You're losing money. That's the hiss. You could be making more money over here. Da, that's the hiss. Hey, do you realize that this market is wide open? You could be grabbing some of that business. That's the hiss. So that's how I would, you're creating not so much pain as you're creating the awareness of how much money they're losing. Now, if you want to call that pain, then we would agree on that, Tom. Let me know what you think of that answer, man. Love to hear your feedback. Uh, I look uh, to your content and, and call it conversing with people and not be afraid to challenge clients and it actually works well. It does, David. They actually respect you more and they say, okay, you're a business person. And they go, okay, this guy's in it with me. That whole thing about taking their point of view, being in it with them, that's what they want. They really want a conversation. And again, if you just think about how you want to be sold to, and then that's how you sell to people. That's why, you know, it's, it's funny how that's right in front of us. All right, we got Mubashir, Aftab. Let me know if I messed that up, man. I apologize if I did. Hi, Victor. I'm a sales rep for a trucking company and try to close. Uh, clients, but they are so focused on the cost that I pretty much uh, said trying to sell at cost. What are they so concerned about? Well, think about it. You know, if you look at the trucking business, I worked with a, uh, a fleet management company. It was here in Georgia. I'm trying to remember the name now. It's a fleet management company. And one of the things they were concerned about, I don't know what you're selling. They're trying to close them on I'm a sales rep for a trucking company and trying to close them out. It depends what you're trying to sell them. For example, uh, there's a study that was done with uh, selling to um, uh, trucking companies and trying to get people to buy new trucks, right? The, uh, what do you call that front part of the truck? God, I forget. It's the trailer and the cab, the cabin. And so what they realized is that they were selling these, these cabins, but they couldn't really sell them, right? They couldn't really sell the truck, the, the cabin, the front part. And God, what is the name of it? Help me out with the first part of that. I think it's, a, it's the cabin. Well, anyway, where they sleep and the whole bit. 
And so they said, look, it's comfortable. They got beds in there, the whole bit. And so what happened was uh, they then did study on when you don't get good sleep, what typically happens? You don't get good sleep, you fall asleep. You get sleepy and you have to make more stops, so forth and so on. So all of a sudden they typed, they tied resting in the cabin, sleeping, comfortable, to how much time is being lost on the road, right? They really tied those two together. And then the chairs were ergonomically designed to reduce like back pain, especially if you're driving for more than whatever the, the limit is these days, six, seven, eight hours. And they tied that into people calling in sick or people not being able to do additional runs. In other words, more truck runs. And they start tying that into numbers. And so they're saying, look, you can look at this cost, but again, the whole his thing, look what it's really costing you because you don't have an ergonomically designed chair or comfortable cabins for them to rest. Those are the things I would look for depending on what you're selling. So let me know, man. Uh, Jitesh, beautifully said. Gracias, champ, right back at you. You're welcome, man. JM, appreciate you. Golden Nuggets, how do you trigger customer to switch if his or her current provider is a relative <laughs> and moving away from him would be, would break his heart. These are tough ones, Jay. That, man, that, that's a tough one. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I might have to tap out on this one, man. I got to be honest with you, man. I might have to tap out because, you know, it's, they have this relationship, right? And, and by the way, there's two types of switching we can do here. One is that you can do a gentle switch and then one is a hard switch over. Let me explain the two and then let's walk through it. If it's a hard switch over, like leave him, go to him, come to you rather, right? Leave him, come to me. That might be tough because they have a relationship and there's a, there's a level of trust there, right? And again, they've done business with them. They've always take care of, took care of them. Even when there's a problem, they were always there. So there's a level of trust there. And if they're a relative on top of that, you know, assuming that they're on, you know, on, 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 on good, within good standing, it's it's a hard one. It's a really hard one. Uh, I would probably just move on and find somebody else because that's a tough one. But then there's the not the switch over, the gentle switch over, which is maybe the relative is getting all the business today, but maybe you can come in and grab just a little bit, like a slice of business, right? And then I would use the argument about positioning yourself number two, which I would say, look, I know your mind, da da, and he's your brother-in-law. I get that. I said, but business is business, and let me ask you a question. In business, isn't it always good to have options? And he's going to say, of course it is, Victor. And I would say, well, that's all. I, I just want, I just, want, I, Jay, just want to be an option. I'm not asking for 100% of the business. Maybe just, you know, throw a bone my way. 5% of the business, just so we can demonstrate that if you ever need us, we're there for you, and let us show you what we can do. Again, I understand he's your, he's your, he's your relative. You can't, you don't want to give up that business, but how about throwing a little bit my way? I would use kind of that strategy, but that's a great question, man. You guys are killing me tonight with great questions, man. So thank you. Uh, hello, so any suggestions for a, a startup apparel company? Michael, Chris, just too broad of a question, man. Uh, just remember, if I can give you a tip, you're not in the apparel business. You're in the marketing business first. Remember that. You're in the marketing business first, right? Because I know what you're saying, but Victor, we got special apparel. Michael, you're in the marketing business first. So make sure you have a strong marketing strategy and presence so that people know you actually exist, man. That would be my big one right there, man. Uh, Matthew with the one, man, agree. All right, Monet. I'm just going to call you Monet because I think it's cool. What is a good way to get referrals from people when they don't want to use when they don't want to use your products or services? Is that, you mean the person that you, you're asking somebody who didn't buy from you to give you a referral. Is that what you're asking? Because if you're asking that, that's tough because they, they haven't used it and nobody wants to give up. You know what I mean? People only want to give up referrals when they themselves are satisfied with what they have. You know, they're using it. They go, you know what? I, I want to refer some friends to you. Uh, so different strategies. Uh, by the way, in the Sales Velocity Academy, I have a referral video series. But, you know, the, the thing I would emphasize, if they're not buying the product and you're asking them for referrals, I don't handle that. I don't really solve it. To me, that's a difficult one. Uh, Monet, I don't have an answer for you on that one. But if they're buying from you, then there's different strategies you can use because if they love the product, it's just a matter of me going back a month later saying, how are you liking the product? You know, just checking in, what's going on, this and that. And then when you're asking a referral, this is a great tip, by the way, when you're asking for a referral, be very specific in terms of what you're looking for. For example, and I use the pool uh, business because I think it's a great example because it's a product and service at the same time. And that is, I would say to you, Monet, after you've been satisfied with your pool, 
Monet, do you know anybody like yourself that has two kids or three, whatever it may be, right? And they have a big yard and they've been thinking about buying a pool. Does anybody come to mind? Notice how I drew that for them. I didn't say, hey, do you know anybody else who might be interested in the pool? No, because I know who my target market is. Married, with children, under the age of 10, right? Uh, big backyard, so forth and so on there, at least on half an acre, whatever it may be. Then, and they're not in a community. It, you know, because if they're in a community, they probably have a community pool. So I would be very specific. So that's a big tip when it comes to asking for referrals. So I don't know if I could help you on the real problem, but at least you got something out of the question. I hope. I own, I owe, no, you probably own a, pump, a plumbing company, and I'm trying to get new accounts the same way, uh, the same way. Appreciate the lesson, man. Cool. Very, very cool. I'm going to start wrapping up in just a bit. You guys are hot and heavy today, man. You guys are really going for it. Uh, my Sarah, Jessica McNally, my sales territory has changed four times in just shy of a year, unfortunately. This is not going well. I haven't even read the second part of your statement, but I know this is not going to go well. It's not going to end well, is it, Jessica? Why, what would be your advice for me when accounts are frustrated with moving around reps and how to power through? Let me tell you why I feel your pain. I'll tell you why I feel your pain, Jessica, because I actually left the company because they kept switching my territory. I would work a territory, uh, not as bad as yours though, uh, you shot four times a job a year. No, mine was I worked it for a year, which means I knew the customers. I'm prepping them. I'm like, you know, I'm sowing some serious seeds here. And just as I'm about to reap, right, all of a sudden they switched my territory for no good reason. Oh, I was just livid. And I literally left the company. I'd like, you know, because if you did it to me once, you'll do it to me again. In your case, they did it four times. And so that's a very frustrating situation to be in. So uh, uh, without knowing who your manager is, unless they have a very good, compelling, strategic reason for doing that, that's bad sales management. Unless, again, they have something, some strategy I don't know about. But switching territories four times, that's cruel to do that to any salesperson. So... All I can say is, might be time, might be time. You know what I mean? Uh, how do I sell an elastic product in a bad market? How do you sell an elastic product in a bad market? The, when you got prices changing, I mean, that's, that's a tough one, man. You know, when prices are changing so dynamically, uh, by the way, Matthew, I'm gonna take a total tangent on you, but I'll try to circle back to it. And so uh, I was talking to a client in Lebanon, Lebanon, yeah, that Lebanon. And, you know, in their market right now, they've put a freeze on how much they can withdraw from their banks, right? And you want to talk about uh, price changes, and that is they're looking at prices that in the morning it's one price and in the evening it could be a second price. So when you got that type of dynamic, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's just frustrating. And then, and then if you got a bad market, uh, and if you can change prices and you got a bad market, I mean, you got to then hone in on people who actually can afford your product, right? So you got two different situations. One is you got dynamic pricing. And if you got dynamic pricing, it's a bad market. It's a hard target to hit because then you got to manage your pricing. But in a market where your prices are more fixed, right? Right. Uh, then all of a sudden, the bad market is you have to hone in on people who can afford your product or service. We'd love to know what product you're selling and to what market. Can you hit me with that? And maybe I can kind of push a little bit with you. Uh, Victor, have you done any pieces on sales training for those with ADHD? I struggle with simplifying these things for my team. So all my stuff, man, I think all my stuff, I, I like to think, Steve, uh, love the uh, emoji, by the way. Uh, the uh, All the things that I teach are tried to simplify them. And that's why, you know, the sales model in a lot of my courses are very short. I think I only have one or two very big courses, long courses, because... Um, by the way, if you're part of the Sales Velocity Academy, uh, Steve, you should check out uh, the Monday Morning Sales Workout. The Monday Morning Sales Workout. The Monday Morning Sales Workout is a 15-minute drill that you do with your salespeople every Monday. And I give you specifically the drill you walk them through, everything from prospecting to closing. And I give you the sheets. It's all, all up on the site. And basically, every week, you can just do a 15-minute drill with them. So if that's what you're looking for, 
then that is the ideal program for you. Again, it's included in the Sales Velocity Academy. Check it out. I think you might like it. How do you gain their trust? And again, Bridget, remember, it's about two things. Taking their point of view and then keeping their best interest in mind. That's what I do. I mean, there's subtle things you can do, right? Really listening well. Like when people talk fast, I talk fast. If I'm in New York, I talk fast. If I'm in, I don't know, if I'm in Minnesota, I tend to slow down a little bit. If I come to Georgia, I really slow down a little bit in the South. So there's a lot of things you can do, but I think people just want you to demonstrate without using techniques that first of all, you take their point of view, you get them, you understand what they're going through and how hard that decision is. And then you have their best interest in mind, which means you're not reaching in, in their pockets, you're trying to look out for their wallet. That's what people want. They want to feel that. And then the third component of that is, and we talked about it already, is that you have to be a domain expert. You've got to know your product so well or your service so well that you can challenge customers and help them make a better decision because that's what they're also looking for. If you take my point of view, you have my best interest in mind, and you help me make a better decision, you challenge me on why I made certain decisions, and that's what I'm looking for. So that's the mindset you should have to build trust. All right, we wrap up in just a bit. Uh, is it Chida or Chidi? Okay, great job as always. Uh, I'm picking you, man. Thank you, man. Tony Kaufman in the house. Hi, Victor, right back at you. Young injury attorney. Dude, you even dress like an attorney, man. Love it. There is a sales aspect of my career for closing a case settlement and even getting a client to sign with the firm. How can I best do that even though they know I'm young? Dude. What you do is, one, admit that up front. Uh, so I got a program called Blocking Objections. That's one of the things I would recommend. Up front, is, I would say something like this. Like, many of my clients think I'm young, and therefore, I can't represent them accurately or to the best of my ability or to the best of the firm's ability. And then you got to figure out a nice pitch after that. But if I can show you that I've worked on certain cases just like yours, da-da-da-da-da, would you be open to hiring a younger attorney? And again, remember that just because you're young doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It's only how you look at it, right? Because being young means what? Hey, you're probably more up to date on some of the new changes in the laws than most people are, right? You understand, you have a different perspective, Ryan. So I, I want you to kind of embrace the fact that young is cool, young is good, right? And then I'll emphasize that I got a bunch of old dogs behind me. So whatever I don't know, you're hiring me, but you're really hiring me and you're getting them. So you get the best of both worlds. Young guy with the energy to fight for your stuff, but also I got fallback in case I need help, I'll bring in the reserve. So that's why you want to start sign with our firm. Some pitch like that, but embrace that youngness and say, here's some advantage to being young. Dynamic, learning, more aggressive, right? more energy. You know what I mean? You're just there. So find whatever that is that makes you different and embrace that thing. Superpower is being young, brother. Okay. At what point can you recognize that no matter what you say, they're just not going to switch? Hence, enter. Okay. Next mode. Yeah. If they're not, when I ask questions about, you know, when you feel those pushbacks that are not genuine, you know, Jay, you know, well, let me think about it and I'll get back to you, you know, next week or next month. Or why don't you come back and see me next month? Those are to me, those, those are lines that, you know, they're just trying to get out of it. That's when you say something like this. I said, if, I said, most people tell me, and again, this is the standard line I use. When, it's, when a client tells me, you know, you know, come see me next month, it's usually because they're not interested. And it's a nice way of saying no right now, which is okay. Or you're interested, but you really don't want to do it right now. Which one is it? And if he says, no, I really want to do it. I just don't want to do it right now. I said, I'll tell you what. Why don't we go ahead and sign the contract and then I'll post date it, right, for that day and we can launch on that day and we'll be ready to go. And then you watch the reaction because now you know if they're lying or not, right? So just be like a little more, I don't want to use the word aggressive, but, you know, it's okay to be a little insistent on getting a real answer. All right, I'm going to take two more and I'm out of here. What are... A few pre-framing techniques or strategies once the appointment call has been made. Uh, I know what you're asking. I just don't know the context. So what are pre-framing techniques or strategies once the, so you've made the appointment? So a pre-framing strategy, if I think I understand your question, could be, Mr. Customer, we set the date, we set the time. Then you could pre-frame like, now here's what's going to happen. What I'll need you to have available is this, this, this. So that's number one. Number two. Make sure you're, if you're, it's a couple thing that your wife is there. And also what I would do is review the information. And the third thing is be ready. You know, 
whatever it may be. And so that's how I would use pre-framing and conditioning. I would tell them what to expect. You know what I mean? And once I, they know what to expect, that's kind of the pre-framing strategies I like to use. So for example, uh, when I talk to clients about when they sign me for sales training, Victor, we want you to do the sales training for our company. I said, great. And we set the date, great. We set the fee, great. Now I said, now, here's what I need from you. One, and I typically set up a meeting two weeks before the event where we're gonna talk about da da da. Number two, what I'll need from you during that meeting are these five things. Your five typical topics you want me to cover. And then that's how I'll be framing the whole conversation. And in other words, I tell them, I, I kind of, I'm kind of sneaky about it in a good way. I said, one, I'll meet with you two weeks before we meet, before I speak. Two, I'm going to ask you to think of the top five things you want me to talk about that would make this meeting a success. Now, if I talk about those five things, which they wanted me to talk about, and I hit it out of the park, I'm almost guaranteed that they're going to be a totally satisfied customer. So that's how I use pre-framing or pre-strategies before I get there.